Hello, everyone, and welcome to TPA Global's webinar on Is Digitization Making TP Invisible? For this webinar, we have two presenters today, Igor Peters and Fernanda Sharma, who will guide you through this topic. To give a brief introduction about both of our speakers, Igor Peters is a partner at TPA Global in Amsterdam. He has more than 18 years of experience in international taxation and transfer pricing. His previous experience includes eight years as an in-house tax counsel in Germany and the Netherlands, with a focus on tax risk management and transfer pricing. He has been working in designing and implementing the tax control framework for various MEs. He has also been involved in APA and MAP discussions with Dutch and German foreign tax offices. His industry experience includes heavy machinery, oil and gas engineering, construction and consumer electronics. Our second speaker of today is Perenda Sharma. He is also a partner at TPA Global's office in Amsterdam. He has an overall experience of 15 years working in UK, India, US and now the Netherlands. He has been working in transfer pricing for the last 13 years in the areas of planning, documentation, controversy management with major organizations and multinational corporations. He has worked on more than 300 clients in India and overseas and has provided them with a range of transfer pricing services. His industry expertise includes information technology, automobile and auto ancillary, pharmaceuticals, engineering services, luxury products and freight and forwarding industries. With this introduction, I would like to invite our first speaker, Igor Peters, to start the presentation. Uh, actually, before we get to the presentation, I would like to uh, inform everyone that in case you have any questions, please type them in the chat box, but we will address them at the end of the presentation. So if you type your question in the chat box, it will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, with this, I now invite Igor Peters to start the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Afisha. Okay, welcome everybody to Is Digitization Making TP Invisible? So the topics for today will be what is digital economy? What are the tax challenges of digital economy? Uh, what is the OECD proposals for solving the, the tax challenges? And then most important part of the presentation where we will focus on the transfer pricing challenges of the digital economy. Yeah, to start with uh, the digital economy, huh? what is digital economy that's characterized by the use of the internet as a medium to trade in goods and or services? A lot of uh, businesses have made already the shift towards uh, digitization in order to increase their productivity and their uh, profits subsequently. Uh, one of the, the first tax challenges for, I think, what is considered to be a kind of pre-runner of uh, digital economy, that was the so-called Piedras Negras case in the, in the United States. Uh, where a radio station was providing broadcasting services from Mexico into the USA. And they argued that the radio broadcasting services provided by a Mexican company into the US constituted a permanent establishment of that Mexican company and was therefore liable to taxation at source, every uh, US taxation at source. So this was the first uh, case where the, the uh, typical bottleneck of digital economy uh, comes to the front, the, the non-physical presence that was still argued to be a PE. However, the court decided that these activities cannot constitute a PE. Now, if you look at the changing face of the internet uh, economy, where a multitude of businesses earn their margins only through the provision of digital goods and uh, their services. The argument advanced by the IRS in the Piedras case no longer seems far-fetched. And actually, if you look at uh, countries, as some countries already have uh, introduced and allowed source taxation, even in cases when there is no physical presence. Uh, looking at uh, the BEPS project, 
that was originally aimed at addressing the, the base erosion and profit shifting of multinationals and the measures proposed by the OECD under the, the action plans they developed appear all to fall short of addressing the real concerns raised by the digitization and most of them are therefore restricted merely to ensuring taxation of e-commerce which is only a fraction of the overarching digital economy now with the reduced barriers to entry and ease of access to global customer base and that is facilitated by the widespread use of the internet a variety of small and bigger enterprises have established their stronghold by providing digital services online databases uh, online marketplaces multi-sided platforms uh, which enables uh, c2c transactions uh, cloud-based storage and, and yeah, similar online uh, services and some of these businesses operate on wholly virtual platforms to serve the customers globally and do not even require a physical presence in any jurisdiction and take for example an online database and with that uh, business model they escape taxation in most jurisdictions well these shortcomings uh, of the measures proposed by the OECD have driven some jurisdictions already to adopt unilateral measures to preserve their fair share of taxation in the case of digital economy. I think, uh, yeah, hopefully, most people are well aware of the most significant of such measures, uh, unilateral measures, is the diverted profit tax, nicknamed the, the Google tax, that is effective already in the United Kingdom and is aimed at taxing businesses engaged in diverting profits away from the UK which are earned through activities performed in the UK and these types of unilateral measures are also being taken currently in Australia, Spain and France and they are targeting businesses operating in the digital sector and defining new rules of what constitutes a PE. I think the, the ATO, the Australian tax authorities, is currently had introduced a kind of uh, notification or registration duty with a quite hefty penalty and although they would have the information already from companies that are doing digital business into Australia because of all the VAT uh, transactions and, and uh, compliance around it, they still want to select all the companies and, and get a better view on them. So it's, it's not about uh, revenue or profits, but they just want to have a separate database of companies that do business. Uh, even just one point I want to highlight that yes you know during your uh, talk you just now mentioned that when OCD looks at the mm -hmm. digital economy they are looking at e-commerce and if I look at the definition given by the OCD or uh, on digital economy uh, they say that uh, digital economy is something which is comprised of markets based on digital technologies uh, that facilitate trade of goods and services through e-commerce uh, and I know that uh, uh, digital economy has gone beyond e-commerce but at the same time e-commerce comprise of a significant part of global trade today and when I look at e-commerce uh, I, I will have uh, you know companies uh, from the industries like uh, we have uh, recruiters we have uh, uh, mobile communications who are now uh, doing a lot of uh, services uh, online without even having physical infrastructure in place you know through satellites then we have uh, uh, payment services we have uh, online tra travel services and I can name many more so do you think that do you think that when we look at uh, the, the, the transpressing principles would the application of those principles would would vary from uh, from uh, industry to industry or from company to company although they are based on that e-commerce that's a broader category I, I see it but then you know one company will have it's more platform driven company another company uh, would be where uh, they are making online sales 
uh, and uh, you know, customer goes to a website and they buy a product. So where do you see the application of uh, transfer pricing principles, do you think? Would they gonna vary from one model to another? Yeah, I think a big difference is, of course, whether you provide like a tax consultant or uh, the, the fact that you use email or, or a fax machine to get your services into uh, Canada from the Netherlands. Uh, still, you have your, your physical presence in, in uh, the Netherlands as a consultant. And I think that you don't have any issue with the fact that, that you have a receiver of that uh, service being resident in, uh, in Canada. And the difference with uh, uh, digital economy where you would, uh, in your example with a platform, you would enable customers to uh, yeah, do business with each other or in a C2C business or you would provide yeah, pure digital uh, services like providing uh, music. And they're really strong. I think the, the, the challenge is somewhere between uh, what is the, the right of taxation? Is that with the source state or is that with the, the resident state? Yeah. And the, the, the business models, now for sure we can, can elaborate on that and, and how they interact yeah. with, with TP and or uh, the, the tax challenges uh, itself. Yeah. yeah, thanks. And I think Italy has, of course, a strong reputation on, on well, trying to tackle uh, tax challenges by, uh, well, recently they had a kind of raid almost of the Google office in Italy. And they stated, well, those people are actually functioning as a PE in, in Italy, uh, where, where the UK introduced new legislation, because according to their earlier principles, there was no PE, and the Google employees were merely promoting and marketing the, the Google products, but not actually making the sales. I think there, the, the and the UK diverted profit tax came in because also the, the HMRC realized that almost 80% of the UK realized turnover was um, directly related to the, the marketing and promotion activities. And, and actually now they are, I think there were some uh, newspaper articles about it. They are actually closing the, the a sales or service contract inside the UK and therefore reporting it under the UK deferred profit tax. But even the, the, yeah. the, small, sorry, the, yeah. the smaller customers, they still continue to sign up online and do that with the uh, island uh, directly. So yeah. there you see the first shift already to, to try to solve this uh, tax. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. And I think we're going to cover in detail later, but in these examples, where you have people on ground, or if you have assets somewhere, you can still feel that substance, you know, and you can say that that country is devoted less. But we have a lot of examples where we don't have anybody's presence there. It's just the online sale happening, and the country where that sale is happening, then we argue on that source taxation, and we and, and now the OCD is looking for, you know, uh, 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 Making sure that the country where from where the sales is being generated, appropriate profits are allocated to that country, and accordingly the taxes should be paid. Yeah, I think that uh, we we will see that in the next slide, and uh, where the OECD uh, comes up with uh, proposals, and one of them is uh, directly coming from the action plan number one, uh, where they. Uh, propose some new um, yeah, taxable presence or, or new nexus concepts. And the first one being uh, having a significant digital presence or and that will then on its turn be a new um, PE definition or deemed PE. If you're purely uh, providing digital goods or services and you do that solely into a certain country and then, then you meet having a, a DP because you have this, this significant digital presence. Or yeah, the other solution, it's a little bit more based on economic uh, presence. 
and where the, the despite this this flexibility you would have in many cases large multinational enterprises will indeed have a textual presence already in the example i gave of uh, google there are uh, marketeers or, or promotional uh, persons on on the ground uh, where their customers are located and of course there are often compelling reasons for businesses to ensure that core resources are placed as close as possible to their key markets or key customers. And it, it makes sense to have some boots on the ground if, if they can serve 80% of your uh, turnover. And of course, they want to ensure a high quality of service and therefore have this uh, direct re relationship with their key uh, clients or key uh, customers. Uh, applied is this 80-20 rule to the Google case, and uh, you see it makes uh, sense. But then, Igor, when I when I Sorry. look at you know the cases uh, digital economy where it's uh, it has progressed a lot from uh, brick and mortar you know economy where you had a physical presence, you had your fixed sets, you have your office, you have a factory or you have distribution uh, channel from where you are making sales. But when I look at now, uh, in, in some digital economy cases, you don't even have presence of people. Sale is happening through online. So the challenge I, the challenge I see here is of attribution of profits is much higher because one, where currently the companies uh, are not paying taxes in those uh, source country where online sale is happening. And if tomorrow the PSEP is deemed peace created, in that situation, there will be a, a significant amount of profit will be attributed uh, to that country. So there, one, the risk of P is obviously there, but then the risk of attribution of higher profit attribution is very high. Because if you have a physical presence, yes, you have already some people there. They're already earning some profits. Uh, and then, you know, you still can have attribution of profits to that location if, uh, if the profits are not attributed as per value creation. But on, in all these cases of online sales where you don't have any presence, I think the challenge is much wider than what we see uh, in other cases which I just described. Yeah, that, that's added the, the two-pronged uh, approach. First, you would need a, a taxable presence or, or whatever it is, uh, a, new, uh, a new nexus, following a new nexus concept. And only then in a second phase or second question would be how to attribute and how much to attribute uh, part of the, the total profit of the total value chain uh, to that PE you just uh, created, how, how synthetic it may be. And then that's interesting in, in the other concept, the significant economic presence and uh, where you would create a taxable presence in a country when a non-resident enterprise has a significant economic presence on the basic of certain factors that evidence a purposeful and sustained interaction with the econo economy of that country via yeah, technology or any other automated tools. And those factors can be combined with a factor based on revenue derived via the online or remote transactions to that country. Uh, I think in France, there was a concept where they already said, well, a lot of uh, users are, are established in France. So they might just be customers. But because you are tapping into the information all the users are uh, providing, and therefore you are creating an intangible, and they would see a kind of pro rata uh, value being created in France, right? just due to the fact that uh, information derived from the users. And for instance, I think Facebook could be a good example where, where you analyze the users. And based on that, again, um, commercials or, or small ads are placed on the website. Yeah, certainly. OK, let's move on to. Uh, this is. Uh, yeah, an overview of how uh, digital economy uh, made here uh, six layers, and where you can see you have yeah constant 
uh, information exchange between all the six layers. And that, that exactly that, that enables an e-commerce enterprise to provide value to its clients or customers. And the user experience is provided by instant, instantaneous interaction among the different six layers distributed amongst various entities of a group. And the, the, you could perhaps vertically uh, draw the, the relevant entities of the group in this uh, structure. But given that a particular function could be distributed among different entities with distinctly identifying which transaction is provided by which entity and attaching the relevant value to such transaction in the supply chain, that's a big challenge. Uh, further, as identified by the OECD, the mobility of functions, for, for example, through the use of server arrays or mirror servers, uh, the, the so-called Google uh, server parks, and that again adds to the difficulty of attaching particular transactions to particular jurisdictions. And although the OECD guidelines do permit aggregation of these transactions, since they're so closely linked or continuous, that they cannot be evaluated adequately on a separate basis, still it would be challenging to identify and characterize the transaction in a scenario where, as in this figure, multiple entities contribute to a portion of each of the activities outlined above. Uh, and in the, yeah, I think. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. One point you gotta have is that when we look at these layers of, in the intercompany transactions, which we have users, user interface, applications, accessibility, software resources, infrastructure, the significance of these layers would vary from one business model to another. So, one business model where it's it has got <coughs> platform, and that platform is where you know the customer can go and buy. Some application, some uh, some games, for example, or for example, uh, by by movies or watch movies. There, you know, the role of that platform in terms of application will be uh, very strong. And but, you know, uh, even if we move from one business model to another, the the key challenge will be that there can be multiple entities who will be involved in developing application, right? So you may mm -hmm. have more than mm -hmm. one entity. In, in, in two different countries and at the same time even when the software development is happening uh, some portion is done here other portion is done in another country but the key driving factor here will be the DEMPI function we, we, we talk about in, in intangible which is development enhancement maintenance uh, 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 protection and exploitation of the intangible so somewhere we have to first of all you know as like other uh, transpassing methodology we follow we have to delineate the intercompany transactions and we need to check who's controlling uh, uh, the important decision making, who's controlling risk and who's actually uh, forming those critical functions which are generating intangible. So to come back to the point where I have more than one entity uh, developing intangible uh, together, then possibly which we'll discuss later in our slides, once we have rewarded to uh, uh, entities who are routine uh, players in the value chain, then I have to split the the residual profit among these two uh, two entities who are contributing to the generation of intangible. So uh, one has to uh, go towards more towards a profit split approach, which we will discuss at a later stage. I think, especially in case of uh, digital economy. Yeah, I think. Yeah, looking at uh, let's, let's go back one uh, slide. Slide number seven, if you, if you look at the, the six layers, uh, users, user interface, applications, accessibility, software resources, infrastructure, and then, then, then depending on the, the kind of digital uh, business, you have a kind of center of gravity where perhaps the data provided by your users is more important or where the accessibility is more important or the, the software resources that are being provided, uh, whether, whether it's software that can be used by the, the users, or you're perhaps selling software, or are you analyzing uh, the, the uh, profiles of, of users? And is 
that's something you develop via you know, an algorithm and then again you can sell that uh, that information is valuable so if you look at the the layers of course somewhere there will be some yeah mo most important or key driver uh, as we would say in in your business model and around this this uh, development of this key driver then again you, sh you should try to to find uh, who is performing as you mentioned one of the uh, tempe functions around uh, the value creation and uh, the creation of the relevant intangible yep. and that, that's uh, if you look at slide number uh, eight and there, there are so many functions in the digital economy uh, business model yeah they don't have to be uh, located in one one spot uh, it's extremely difficult to uh, yeah, to, to pinpoint them but uh, uh, again I'm back to the same point Igor although when I look at here we have this six layer and then we have to ask those probing questions when when a function analysis is done when we are delineating the uh, intercompany transactions that who's taking those strategic decisions uh, who's owning uh, the servers and where are they stores stored across the world right and who's taking those data management decisions and uh, and so basically the key thing is that who is uh, taking those uh, decision uh, on on risk on controlling risk who's controlling risk who's taking those critical decisions around where you know, the value is being created so that would be very that would be really key where we have to allocate a, a, a residual profit among the value creators that who's actually you know taking those critical decisions that will be i think the key uh, in applying the tp methodology for digital economy yeah you're you're completely right uh, all the the tempe function functions and then then for each of them you would have to go through the the you know, risk management analysis i think to see who are the the key um, people functions and where where are they located and uh, here's uh, one for example uh, modern uh, business model the so-called digital furniture design business and it's no longer is the choice of a customer restricted to what is available in a retail shop but you can really convey your exact requirement over the internet you can do it with furniture or with uh, shoes uh, to a marketing specialist who is then able to convey you to a furniture designer so this designer I would design your furniture specifically to your uh, customers express requirements but you would also be helped in this task by accessing the company's own designer software that is stored on its mainframe again uh, and when finished the design could be transmitted to a manufacturing craftsman who would draw up the necessary specifications so that the relevant design could be uh, manufactured in the company's factory and then in order to successfully produce the finished customized products and uh, the various people involved may constantly keep in touch by email and perhaps occasional video conferences or telephone calls and in this example can the furniture designers work be analyzed separately from the computer server transaction or from the development of the computer software which assists the designer and from the participation of the craftsman and even from the manufacturing of the furniture itself as the transactions become more and more complex by back and forth movements among all the members of the multinational group the separate identification and analysis of transactions could become increasingly burdensome and i think with with perhaps making a shoe or a, a part of furniture that that's a little bit easier than and, and if you would look at that slide eight again and, and even go down to well what is the, the software being used who's uh, using the raw data itself who makes the executable code who defines the algorithms and even you know when i look at this where so much integration is happening you know we have a uh, 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 a professional who is uh, 
designing furniture and using a high-end software which is owned by another group entity or possibly with the same entity then it's very clear case but if it's owned by another entity so are we saying that we are moving towards a, 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 a scenario where we have web of web of intercommunality arrangements which i would not like to have so i think mm -hmm. uh, again back to the same point the the two-sided method or what we call as a profit split method would be something uh, important here uh, rather than having a web of intercommunalities you know uh, uh, floating for these type of uh, cases yeah i think that that uh, refers perfectly to to your earlier question eh? where where are the intangibles located and, and who's doing uh, exactly what who's managing it within and that that's yeah extremely complicated so let, let's move on to a little bit better example and that, that's the b2b platform eh? you mentioned it already where we uh, businesses uh, meet each other so the also the OSD recognized that as the communications revolutions makes related party transactions more complex and unique and therefore performing functional analysis even becomes more difficult we just uh, shortly touched upon it I take take an example of a b2b platform and the uh, consider the activities described for the b2b the development of uh, search algorithms development of codes could be undertaken by technical teams with extensive support from automated software and special development platforms and further they may uh, many of the services of the website or the platform itself such as collection of vendor information and even entering into free service agreements could be undertaken completely by the platform itself and note sometimes even without any human or entity uh, intervention uh, in this backdrop the issue is on the manner of allocating functions to the entity that develops the algorithm or the code vis uh, vis and the entities that uh, yeah, from ip point of view own the algorithm code and own the development platforms that support the algorithm and the code development. So, in addition, given that the provision of the free services may help in development of the user base, uh, which in itself can be a key intangible, the issue remains how to allocate the functions performed by a computer. Uh, for example, how much of the function can be attributed to the ownership of the computer server and the software? or the development and adaptation of the original software or the programming of the computer. Is a server merely a database or does it correlate uh, programmatically and enable the delivery of the output to the end user in such a way that it is the prime asset for this B2B platform? Now it's difficult to assess what, what are the key function in, in such a scenario and therefore it should be uh, yeah, analyzed in, in detail it's I'm, I'm yeah, yeah you, you, got, you know this looks like a very uh, peculiar situation where i have kind of artificial intelligence where i have uh, some uh, very smart uh, uh, machine and uh, which was obviously developed by people in, in, in a company and uh, that artificially intelligent machine, uh, you know, churns out data, takes a lot of decisions, and and less and less involvement of people is required. Uh, now, if I look at this case where I say that this machine is owned by a group company, and uh, but at the same time that company only owns it, and uh, one case is where other group company is developing it, uh, maintaining it on on a ongoing basis. And if that other group company is taking critical decisions, uh, then yes, uh, one has to attribute a, a good amount of profits to that entity also. But if I take another case where this artificial intelligence machine is self-fulfilling, which means uh, you you do not need people to further develop it, then how do you take that case? 
in this case possibly the entity which owns it and obviously uh, i assume that that entity also uh, developed that asset uh, over the period of time but now you don't need too much development because it's just self-fulfilling self-generating then possibly in this second case the return of uh, residual profit will attribute to the entity who owns this asset now yeah we're we're yeah, less people is, is is still some people I would say. So I think still you would go back to the the principle that you would look where where are your significant uh, people functions located, tie them in to the relevant Dempe functions, and and there I think you made a kind of weighting in in their yeah, co ownership, and and therefore in the the relative value creation of this, this platform and if, if you move that platform to another entity to, to just run it there yeah still I think in, in the background uh, the uh, ownership does not change although you can locate it on any server it doesn't matter where yeah. your, your people usually don't don't move with it and I think most most software or platform and needs uh, just look at a uh, famous um, C2C uh, platform in the Netherlands, uh, like like uh, eBay, for instance. I think they still do constant improvement. Uh, there, there are other marketplaces being developed, so they they need uh, constant enhancement of, of, of their, their functions. So it's not it's not not static. Yeah, but my point is that you know gradually we are moving to a world where people function per se like human beings involved in uh, developing the assets uh, is possibly shrinking because you know it's just self-learning asset. But at the same time, who created that self-learning asset obviously will get that reward. And at the same time, who's maintaining it uh, uh, you know on an ongoing basis, always self-learning. Uh, that's uh, that entity would uh, actually claim for uh, for for more profits as that if that entity is also uh, has made investment on that asset over so many years. Yeah, per, yeah perhaps there's uh, yeah, I think people are still looking for it kind of perpetual mobile that is generating profits and endlessly like 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 a kind of oil you can uh, pump up. I mean. Uh, what what is uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, one of the other transfer pricing challenges, and that is the identifying whether the transactions involve the, the use or the, the transfer of intangibles. However, uh, we have uh, uh, we can can define several subsets of it. Uh, to to get back to your. Uh, Example for under the automated technology on the website and that enables the collection of vendor information. Setting up the digital shop font electronically is in parallel developing an intangible of the user database. And is, is it doing that by, by itself or, yeah, it was of course created by uh, somewhere, somewhere there, there is also a center of gravity within this development. But and you, you can still tie it into uh, one one uh, entity, I guess, with, with uh, a kind of majority, perhaps. Uh, another uh, activity, uh, one group entity could develop applications and software toolkits as a service to another entity, which would commercially exploit the same, uh, by providing the same as a feature of the paid service. However, the intellectual property in the applications would be owned by a different entity, by a dedicated IP holding company of the group. And if, if we go uh, back to this slide, and then, then you see how detailed you need to uh, delineate the, 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 all the functions between all these, these layers again. So that, that makes it uh, yeah, hard to do. Let's move. 
uh, here more and more examples are uh, given. So also a part of the difficulty involved in identifying the transaction and undertaking its functional analysis. The issue is whether the transaction itself involves the transfer or the, the use of uh, intangibles. And for example, you have uh, entity A that's providing software development services that would be used by group entity B. And if you look at the current authorized OSD approach, and that the risk follows function, the risk and the economic ownership thereof would be required to be allocated to the entity that develops the intangible, in this case, entity A. That's not, again, you're, you're always coming back to this uh, yeah, tempe approach and, and risk management approach. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you're right, but when I look at this, especially in case of digital economy where this high automation is happening, and I again, I'm back to my uh, example of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, if the asset is self-learning, I think it will carry an enormous weight uh, uh, in terms of the receiving the residual profit. The entity who owns it, not only as an investor, but also uh, as an entity uh, who is also maintaining it. But there may not be a lot of people functioning around that asset, but as I said, that asset is self-learning. So uh, somewhere, I think, uh, obviously, we will follow uh, the, the 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 approach pro given by the OCD, which says that this follows functions, the risk, and the economic ownership. So that will be the key. But uh, how much weight functions get and how much weight asset get, that would vary, you know, uh, how much automated that platform or that asset is. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And uh, no. Even when you say yeah, self self learning uh, software, I think there were recently some uh, pilots performed by uh, it? Microsoft. I don't think that that self learning went uh, well, and it got totally out of hand. But but still, then then I think you're in in the interesting part or or question. Uh, where, where something is developed and then yeah, is it self-learning or does it start uh, absorbing data and then then perhaps you're again in the French uh, concept uh, the, the source of the information should also be entitled to part of the, the revenues so so yeah, that, that might be something for the, the future So, point number four uh, in, in uh, transpricing challenges, the identification of the most appropriate method to determine the arm's length price uh, and the traditional uh, arm's length principle methods of comparable uh, or cups or cost plus method and resale price methods are typically considered to rely heavily on transactional similarity and are viewed as inappropriate to address complex cases, including those with intangible property. And especially if you keep, keep in mind, I think slide number eight it was, and how, how uh, uh, extreme integrated and, and uh, the also integrated the development of this intangible property uh, is. So, can, can you, uh, in this backdrop, uh, new methods such as the profit split method and the transactional net profit method were developed. Uh, those methods address the issue of absence of lack of third party data or data that was not uh, considered to be sufficiently similar to the transactional elements and were regarded as a useful uh, factor to, to eliminate those differences. Uh, although it was recognized that these methods dilute the importance accorded to the transactional comparability, uh, which is imperative to maintain the sanctity of the arm's length standard. So looking at uh, dynamic business models of digital economy in light of the factors discussed, uh, they are challenging the appropriateness of the new methods as well. 
and especially since a variety of circumstances can influence operating expenses and net profits, for example, questions on the appropriateness of the net profit method when the enterprise is in its early stages of functioning, especially if, if you develop it, but in the end it would be dependent on, on data collection, then you might see uh, 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 a shift of, of the, the of the, the, the value the intangible is creating and, and where it is doing that. And, and Igor, uh, one important point uh, while applying this method will be that uh, the company should should also keep in mind that how much profits are there in the total value chain. So it should not happen that I give for my cost centers the, the routine return and then after that, what I have left with me, and then I apply, uh, uh, then I give that remaining profit to the entities who are uh, creating substantial value. And then I say they should get a residual profit. And if there are more than one entity who's generating <coughs> intangibles or mm -hmm. creating significant value, then I have to split that residual profit among those uh, uh, significant value creators or you know, entities who are uh, creating intangibles, uh, but then it should not happen that uh, you know uh, too much has been paid by applying uh, methods like uh, uh, either applying traditional methods like cup, uh, resale minus or cost plus to the routine players, or even applying TNMM method. Then and then finally, when I'm uh, the profits I've left with, then I just need to uh, allocate losses. Uh, to the uh, entities who are creating uh, intangible. So I think it will be important for, for for a company to be conscious of that, how much is the total return in the value chain. And that should be somewhere in mind when we are applying these methods to different set of intercompany transactions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I understand you correctly, of course, you cannot uh, split more than, than, than you have. And, and it, yeah, applying methods that that are more or, or more and more suited for more routine-like functions. Of course, you can start there and then try to make a, yeah a weighting. I think of all your your functions in order to come to an appropriate uh, split of your residual profit uh, between all the and uh, and perhaps you might. Uh, identify so many uh, co-owners of your intangible, but, but still you can hopefully give uh, appropriate weighting to them and uh, split it. And one of the so and last uh, challenges, or at least what we identified. And what is the, the identification of comparable uncontrolled transactions? And the objective of comparability analysis is always to seek the highest practical degree of comparability and recognizing that there will be unique situations which could be a result of business complexity and cases involving valuable intangibles where the traditional methods cannot reliably be applied alone or exceptionally cannot be applied at all. So looking at the context of electronic commerce, it becomes more difficult to determine what the transaction actually is. And we saw that on the, the interconnections and therefore even more difficult to find out enough about a third party transaction to conclude that they are comparable. So the concern is whether the standard of comparability can be met to, to, uh, to find it. So the arm's length standard is not likely to permit the application of a traditional method to determine the computer server revenues based upon profit margins or prices from third party information providers, unless those uh, third parties like the multinational at hand also had developed the information database and equally reliable software. And there, there are so many uh, differences to, to spot out and, and perhaps eliminate them already to exclude them from, from your brain set of uh, comparables. 
and the, the comparability of dealings on the internet with those conducted through a more traditional technologies may be debatable and uh, they are simply not comparable and I think above that comparable transactions can be hard to discover and trace and particularly uh, those transactions uh, look at uh, the scheme which take place in private networks and it makes it even more uh, more difficult so some examples of, of uh, identifying of and, and allocating returns to intangibles in the digital economy and there are uh, different categories of assets a B and C uh, categories so how would you uh, allocate your intangible related returns uh, control over a certain uh, category of fixed or intangible assets and that that on its turn defines the claims on the uh, non-intangible premium also and you can uh, where would you mentioned already for you under, look at the whole uh, value chain so but you can sorry, yeah. just to stop you if i go back to the first method again when I'm looking at control over certain uh, assets, which defines claims on non-intangible uh, premium, so you know it, it, this looks more like a routine uh, return I'm just giving to them, and they are kind of cost centers, or they are not actually a, a profit center, or in, or maybe they can be just investment center, so they just get in the new OCD. Uh, uh, in the new OCD setup, you know, uh, the guidance, the way they've come out now, after uh, October uh, deliverable of the OCD, is that they will only get a risk adjusted return, just being the mere, mere owner of the asset, being an investor. Um, let me rephrase that. If I understand you correct, and you, you can be uh, investor, you're funding something. Yeah. And then you can be actually performing something eh? and yes. then performing, I think, of one of the, the Dempe functions. Yes. And then, yeah, there, there of course, is, is a yeah, big question that does an investor perform one of the Dempe functions or yeah. not? And then you see then if he's not performing any of that, yeah, then... then uh, An investor also, if just like giving funding to my group company, but then, when I did give give funding, I did not check whether how 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 much secure my funding is. Mm -hmm. If I even didn't check that, I just get a risk free return. But if I have checked that my funding will be secured, but I'm not involved in DMP function, then I get my return as an as a lender, right? But if I have also performed some of the DMP functions, right, then my return goes beyond. The return which I will earn as a, as as uh, as an entity who's giving funds. So I think when we are looking at our case of digital economy, what we are looking at where the uh, the asset owner as an investor, if he's also performing certain benefit function, then it gets into the discussion of value chain analysis and it gets some portion of the residual profit. Yeah, they're, 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 I think the same, yeah, of course, same, same person can have different uh, uh, facets. Uh, uh, so so one, one part of his function is perhaps uh, related to, to exercising uh, uh, control over one of the Dempe functions. Same time, he may have provided the funding, but I think it's it's a add-on, so you you just add it up because he's performing more than a mere uh, providing the, the funding. And we have some some other um, example, for instance, to to and uh, where where can you find some comparables? Uh, IP law infringement cases. Uh, you have the so-called fifteen Georgia Pacific factors. And, and, uh, and where we're in the past, perhaps uh, 75 or 80 20 uh, split was given between the, the owner of an intangible and the user of an uh, intangible. 
and you see more and more cases where there is a 50 50 uh, split so so yeah, that that kind of approach can be used to to yeah, to make it comparable even for your yeah. applied uh, profit split. And here I've added, uh, and I think this is the, the high core element where we were talking about uh, for render. And uh, the revised transfer pricing uh, guidance makes it even more clear that uh, legal ownership alone does not necessarily generate a right to all or indeed any of the return that is generated by the exploitation of the intangible but that the group companies performing the important functions and uh, contributing the important assets and controlling economically significant risks as determined through an accurate delineation of the actual transaction will be entitled to an appropriate return yeah, that can be bigger than just having uh, provided the funds. So looking at, at this this scheme, the scheme as such is still applicable also to all the, the functions performed within a, a digital business model. And look, look at their internal value chain. So let's... Okay, with with this, I'm, I'm looking at our uh, chat box for for the questions. Then, then uh, otherwise. Yes. Yeah, so uh, now you know we have opened uh, this floor for any questions. So if you have any questions, you can ask us, and so that we can address your uh, queries. Yeah, and otherwise, we're we're um, happy to. Uh, receive your questions via the email also. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Then, uh, Avisha. Yeah, uh, in, ca in case there are no questions, I see some people raising their hands. In case you have some questions, could you please type them in the chat box so we can address them? And it's not clear no. what we're playing. Not anymore. Yeah, then, then. Not anymore, I don't see. And we will put yeah. on the... Okay. In the... In case uh, there are no more questions, then this marks the end of our uh, session of today's webinar. The webinar's presentation slides and the recording will be available on TPA Global's website very soon. In case you have any more questions on the topic, Please feel free to contact the two panelists who were presenting the webinar today. In case of any questions on this or a related topic, please contact TPA Global through our website. Thank you very much for joining, uh, and I wish you a very nice evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.